Welcome back, my friends, to our continuing tutorial on Interstellar Frontiers. How to play the game. Play the game. This is a solo game. It can be played with your friends, associates. Can be played over the internet. Can be played through the mail. Uh, could be played across the tabletop. I guess you could take versions of this and make an RPG out of it. Although it's not really the setup for that. Uh, this particular installment is continuing where we left off. We are discovered a planet that's viable we've explored it uh, their next step is to set up a colony since this is our initial colony this would be your capital of your house and eventually it will grow into such it once you've established the colony as your capital the game doesn't allow for movement of a capital so this is it you know any builds you any other colonies and planets you set up after the fact all are support to this particular one and we're going to go through the basic initial steps for this particular endeavor we've already touched on making your time count exploring your planet keeping a system map is something that, that uh, we didn't mention before but kind of imperative this is, as far as I'm concerned, it just makes things simpler. So, as I went, I modified my existing This camera keeps shifting on me. Which is not what I wanted to have happen. And at the beginning, at the very top, this would be what I call my my master my system my planetary system master sheet for my given capital. And there's actually two versions of this for paper keeping, uh, person for paper paperwork for data keeping purposes. However, you want to look at it. One is the worksheet. This is the one where I'll move my ship sheets around. I'll do a lot of my main roles on. And then there's a second one I'll keep as uh, more detailed with more detailed information. And uh, I'll use it. Uh, I'll make a printed version of it for ease of operations. But I keep the digital copy and update that one and print it out frequently as needed. So I can uh, separate things because otherwise these can get a little unwieldy. This one here is the one that we'll work with on a regular cycle basis and it updates this and as needed. The other one, same thing, uh, but serves the same role but slightly different purposes. In this case, this is a, a map of my solar system. The solar system has 10 sections or 10 slices to it. This is how we would explore it. So by definition, we've only explored 10% of this particular system. And this would be this slice here. I, cho I chose randomly a slice. And I know that there are two planets within this slice and an asteroid belt or an asteroid field that also at least crosses through this. So I just arbitrarily decided to create one that covers this part of this section. And I decided in my description of my uh, planets that the planets themselves operated on the fringes of the asteroid field. So it gives it a little bit of color. From the visual perspective, I named my planets. My pl my first one was Planera Shar and Panera Shar. I also chose to name my system Shadar. I got my coordinates, my planetary, my star ch uh, chart information. Systems are still only explore ten percent, and my current cycle is four. It's up here that way I can keep track of what's going on. Uh, on this sheet, I have the basic information for Planera Shar which we already established in a previous uh, installment. The planet is 100% explored. Uh, we, uh, I have established that there are three seasons and roughly 75 cycle a year. And that's not really imperative to the game, although there is a weather chart role that you can, that you can choose to use if you wish to add additional modifiers and what have you. I currently do not have a satisfaction modifier for the planet. Uh, I will get to that at some point. It's not imperative at the moment. Uh, my colonization ship landed, dismantled. As I said in the previous installment, this is a modular ship. It contained a number of builds and the components needed for builds and supplies 
uh, stuff needed initially to get my colony off the ground, including uh, a population of 10,000. So my current population is 10,000. I'll touch on that for a minute. The optimum population and the maximum population. The standard housing concern one is a single construction that can be either broken up into 10 subbuilds of a thousand people apiece, or it could be listed as a number of, uh, depending on this, how you choose to play it out. It could be a town of individual homes, or it could be a series of, of barrack style buildings or apartment complexes, or however you choose to lay it out, visually speaking. The physical part of the mechanics doesn't change. The game or the building itself holds up to 10,000 residents uh, optimally. In a pinch, it can hold up to maximum population of 15,000. That means one of my first first builds needs to be another housing project, another housing concern. This will allow for planetary growth and not exceed the maximum population. There are some negatives for having an overpopulated uh, housing situation. So if I got more people and I have housing, people are crammed into, uh, into spaces that weren't designed to hold them, then it becomes some issues here on the satisfaction modifier chart. But we're not gonna worry about that at the moment. It will take a while first to get to that point and we can more or less build another housing concern fairly easily. Uh, on my sheet, I have, speaking of that, I have, this is what would be considered your construction operation. Each each colonial effort comes with a house, has its own construction operation when it establishes a colony. Uh, it takes you X five cycles to build a construction or a project once you've initiated it, assuming you've had all the materials for it. And then we will touch on that also on a later date and get into more detail on it. I then also have my event role. Every colony gets an event roll. So this is, allows me to roll on certain charts in the core book to have things happen. And some good, some bad, some indifferent to my colony. And then because it is the uh, capital planet, it's also the class A colony of the system that gets a ship traffic roll. Now, because I established this planet as the initial colony, in the system, it's a class A. It's also my capital, so that makes it the capital, which gives it a little bit additional modifiers. <coughs> now, eventually I will establish a second colony on this second planet. Whether uh, I do it on purpose or one of my event rolls just does it for me, it'll happen at that point. This one would be a class B because it is the second one uh, settled in the system. Or it could also be a class C, depending on how it's categorized by myself. And then I have what's called a random development role. This is kind of similar to the event role. In this case, it allows for uh, low tech additions. So it's another way of growing the colony just on a smaller scale. You can choose not to use this if you, if you don't want to. I, I like to add to it because it adds flavor. Uh, like I said, as you can see, I've, I've taped the, the sides down. I've got my ships in place for what's here. And there's the second planet. And it's stuff. All the information that I had rolled up is all typed up that way. Even if I haven't gotten to it yet, it's there. And this is... This is in my planetary exchange. This is an active exchange. And I've already done the paperwork on it, but I've got a blank here, so we're going to walk through how I establish this. Because through this, we monitor how much we're producing, how much we're using, uh, what, our, or what our planetary needs are, uh, what our surpluses are. The sur surpluses allow us to stockpile things for builds or to sell them to passing merchants. This acts as both your plant, your exchange, uh, as in your stock exchange, and your planetary warehouse. The limit here is 150 tons on the exchange, 150 tons in the warehouse. So in theory, you could have up to 300 tons of 
you know, uh, of consumer goods, for example. Currently, uh, my initial colony effort will produce 15 tons of consumer goods and will use 1.5 tons. So that will leave me a surplus of 13 and a half tons every cycle until this increases. This will either stockpile in my warehouse or stockpile on my exchange, which allows me to generate credits. No matter how you choose to balance your exchange, this is something you do everywhere, every cycle. So we will get to that. And we will show you how we established it. This is the master planetary master sheet. As I said, this is different from the planetary worksheet because I'm not going to use it to keep track of ship movements and things like this. This is going to keep track of all my stats and my bills and things of importance that I need to keep a knowledge. Now, yes, in theory, you could create both of them combined, but then you're going to have twice as much paperwork to deal with every time you mess with something. And it's just simpler for me to have these separate because not once you establish these things, not all of them get modified every turn. This this is a basic world map. At some point, I will do, uh, and I'm exploring right now using some uh, hex generators on the internet to see if I can't create a planetary body. You know, so I know it's a grassland. I know there must be water and stuff. There might be some slight oceans. A lot of that is up to me visually to create my own planet. So I could draw this by hand if I chose. Uh, I'm working on getting a smaller hex grid for the series because I'm not exactly happy with how big that one turned out. And this is the all the information part and the stuff that we know about the, uh, the planet. Current population, we know what the mineral resources are, uh, all the stats. Now, listed here, my capital city, which I have yet to have yet to come up with a name for it. Uh, these are my initial colonial builds. These are the builds that came with the, uh, the, the colonization ship. An agri concern, a colonial center, housing complex, a mining concern, a refining complex, the system communications network, also known as the SCN, a storage facility, a factory A, a light boundary, power grid, and a shipyard, plus the Royal Palace. These are builds. So, we look at the base rules you can see this is pretty much what i've got on paper although this is a little simple more simpler version of this because uh every time i tinker with something i come up with something that's slightly different from the original it is what it is keeping track of your colony since each planet should have a planet sheet created in order to keep track of the mr discoveries made by the house this applies to the world's colonies and not colonies this record helps for to prevent repeated checks and makes it easier to decide where to set up outposts for your colonies and where to dispatch mining ships. In theory, every system you go to, you should have a system map. You should, even if you've only been in it once, you should still have a system map for it and acknowledge that you've been there once. That way, if you go back, you can additionally explore it. You can add more stuff. Uh, every time you visit a planet, whether you colonize it or you don't, you should create one of these of course, you wouldn't have all this extra stuff, but you'd have the basics. This allows you to remind yourself that you've been here, you know what you know of it already, and any time you return for additional reasons, you can expand on it. Sometimes a lot of these would be, be really simple because all you're going there for is to mine it for mineral resources, but it's part of keeping the paperwork. Colonizing sooner or later, the house lord must decide decide to colonize the planet, and this is what we've done. Um, initial colonial bill or initial bills included instead agricultural and colonial center, housing complex, mining concern, so on and so on. We know the planet's build modified, the planetary growth. Uh, some of these these some of these builds modify or add to your tax base or add to your population growth. They don't take away from the build modifier, but they do increase the possibility or decrease the possibility of, of how fast your population will grow and uh, how much revenue you'll get out of those particular colonists.
and we talk about the colony's infrastructure. The infrastructure is a specific build. This is a unique build in that it never really truly ends. Uh, it sits up here. This is the only build that I list on my master sheet, and it accumulates itself as I can afford to have excess surplus applied to the needed materials. I will put them down. Uh, what I don't have listed here is the needs at the moment, and I'll get those established at some point here in, near, in, in the near future. I can also apply credits to it. So once all of the basic material needs are met and the credits have been been allot, allotted to it, then the infrastructure is completed at that point. It then rolls over to the next tech level. So in this case, what we're talking about is very rural, very crude roads and paths, very basic uh, waste treatment or uh, waste disposal and, and uh, you know you might have cesspits and in, in, in outhouses at this stage you might have uh, muddy tracks leading through the woods instead of nicely paved roads uh, you're you know you may not have public lighting and other amenities in it it shows in the in the, uh, the infrastructure itself and we will get to that one at some point too I will touch on that when we will go through some of the actual more details on the build because some builds are more important than others. All of them serve a purpose, but some are, in, are in, uh, imperative to have to com to have a continually growing colony. And if some reason you can't accomplish it, you have to find ways to do so. And it cannot, and that's not always easy. And that's kind of the, one of those points of the game. If everything was easy and you could just do it, click, 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 not much of a challenge. Commerce and Labor's Planetary Construction Companies, that's what I was talking about, having the build, uh, the build operation that allows the house to construct builds. There are other ways of doing this. You, you can contract with a, guild, with a construction guild, and they can send a construction ship and construct things for you at, a, at a, quite a, a cost. Uh, this is how your Platinums can get things accomplished, in addition to what the house is doing, is you can get bogged down on builds real easy. One of the problems early on is accumulating the necessary material and making the, judici the, the, the choices of which ones to build early on and which ones to hold off. Because there's some really good builds that you really kind of want, and some are very important to have, but you can't get the materials needed in a hurry, and that could cause a problem. I've made a mistake, and I've had some beta players make mistakes of allotting their construction time to a project that they didn't accumulate the stuff for. And it just more or less backlogged everything else because there's a penalty. If you start a construction project and you cancel in the middle and choose to start a, sec a, a different construction project, you lose everything that went into that first construction project. You didn't stockpile it because they already started utilizing it. And so they just basically bulldoze it over to build the next build. And it's kind of a... We can make an argument, well, well, they just pick up where they left off. Well, that's how you want to play your game. That's fine, but that's not how I set up mechanics. It's a cause and effect kind of thing. That's a personal deal that's on the player, but the rules say otherwise. That talks about storing and stockpiling build needs. And we will deal, we will do a, I will do a tutorial on that one specific because it is a key piece of how this thing works. Workers and techs, making sure you allotted your workforce appropriately and whether or not you have enough to work with. And that is another additional thing to deal with. And then we talk about mapping your first city. Now I've had people ask me, what's the point of mapping a planet? What's the point of mapping the city? Okay, in this case, my capital city. And I will, would create a grid map of some kind and then I would say okay here's my here's my colonial center here's my factory a here's the power grids main operation my reasoning for that is is because we have event rules that allow for NPCs pirates gutter gangs cults a number of terrorists whatever who will attack your colony and you'll have to defend it and knowing what they attack and where it's located it's kind of one of those things you, you need to have and it makes it simpler or easier in my head you choose not to well you know that's on you the uh, talks about the capital class colony 
First Colony is both the seat of government and the home of the House Lord. It, house, it hosts the main government offices as well as the royal palace and key active exchanges for the region. Often heavily fortified and well defended on capital, worlds become the ancestral homes of their founding nobles. You gain one planetary event roll, one ship traffic roll at, at the start. You can add a second ship traffic roll when the house officially controls the second or more colonies establish another system. This is this is important. Uh, I either have to establish an entirely another a new colony in a secondary a second solar system to make this a, a regional power. I can settle a number of colonies in the same system my capital's at, but I don't grant by the eyes of the Imperium it doesn't grant you that status. It just means you're a system lord and not a regional lord. And so we want that. And once we do that, we establish a second planetary role or a second starship traffic role at the capital. So now we get two you know, twice as much traffic coming through because they're coming to the capital and perhaps from there routing to your secondary location. And then a weather roll. And that's one of those things where you can choose to roll it or not, no matter what you want to do. The cycles to do list. Each colony or non-controlled world of a house lord has operatives working on it. Uh, should be uh, a planetary control sheet should be created, and the following roles then should be made if pertinent to the world at the beginning of each new cycle. Update the current number cycle number on the page. Roll for weather. Calculate population growth. Calculate your taxes. Make mining rolls. Track any ongoing build, queue, or construction projects. Roll for your planetary event. Roll for ship traffic. And the various things that go with it, and or roll for active patrol patrol results if you're maintaining patrols, and that's one of those things we get to down the road. Planetary events. So each colony is controlled by a house, and where the house maintains a permanent presence gains an event roll. This this applies to both houses or planets colonies that you've set up yourself or NPC colonies that you, let's say you know of a fringe, a colony with some, you know, uh, something like Tatooine is full of fringers and run by the mob, whatever. And you don't control it as a house lord, but you, your Ministry of Intelligence manages, uh, manages a field office there so you can maintain, a, keep an eye on things or do stuff. Or you have uh, an education ministry set up there to help the locals or whatever. Uh, it just gains you an access to regular reports of what's going on on that particular planet. So you can then make an event roll on that planet and capitalize on them. Either ignore them or allow, utilize them to allow them to help that colony grow. It's a matter of choice. So an example of such is a local sets up a shop blank. This would likely be some sort of tech zero build, such as a pub, restaurant, uh, hat shop, etc. So when we talk about a blank, it says here, terminal on the chart, which uh, some are pretty much self-explanatory, while others may require you to do some mechanical questions or yes, no, or maybe, or investigations to flush it out. Any open, left open, such as a question mark or a blank, are meant to give the player some leeway or allow the event to follow up on a previous event. So in this case, I could choose to have a, a Tech Zero mining operation that picks up one one of those one-ton elements every cycle that's really <laughs> imperative that, that I vital to my ability to uh, do something. Or I could choose to have a restaurant for, for color purposes. It's a matter of aesthetics at that point. Ship traffic rolls, weather. The weather office is any planet with an atmosphere has weather. Weather can affect everything from food stuff production to combat. The weather can turn violent and cause damage or destruction to, on any outpost or colony. This damage is a percentage of one randomly rolled prefab, build or prefab. Weather also affects how special operations and combat vents go, reducing visibility, grounding aircraft, even preventing the event or not from taking place. See combat modifiers for further information. Uh, taxes, this is how we help generate revenue for the house. Uh, they come in a variety of forms, but they're generally dictated by the house lord status modifier, the population counts, and the number of specific builds. Our planetary tax base, planetary taxes, i.e. rent. Now, if a house builds a, or constructs a bill, 
then the house is going to underwrite the expense. That's a negative tax. If a platinum builds a bill, then the platinum is going to pay a version of property tax, which is a bonus to the house. So in this housing, in this colonial effort, for example, the agri-concern is controlled by a NPC platinum. This is a wealthy individual or family of indiv you know, who came along on the colonial effort who is now my agri, my agri platinum. And that person is going to generate 1.5 credits every cycle for the house. The Colonial Center, on the other hand, is a government facility designed to control and run the, the colony. And thus, it is a, owned and operated by the house. And so it's a negative. The reason I have an asterisk there is because I I placed it in another location, and it's a negative five. It costs five credits per cycle to support and operate this particular bill. So the house is eating, eating that and making a profit from these others. And so it's and while the house can build the next housing concern, it might be more uh, sound, physically sound to approach the housing platinum and negotiate with that person to get them to build it for you. And it'll, it'll not, it won't speed things up per se, but it'll save you some money. It's a matter of when we focus on our first build, we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about how that works. And I'm aware that the initial setup of this game is a lot of paperwork. Once you get the paperwork established though, you're just adding to the paper pool, not not having to do it every turn. So I had to create and set up a lot of things first. And those are housekeeping things if you want to look at it that way. So we got property taxes, landing fees, government expenses, our ministry operation expenses, and I'll show you how I, how we we factor those our exchange, which is this thing here, how it's going to make money, components to an active exchange, planetary, the difference between an active and a planetary exchange. All right, so. It's the morning here, and I always my sign this is. Okay. Like I said, I established my planetary master sheet. I have all my basic information from my exploration role. I have established my workforce tracking sheet. In this particular case, my initial colonial effort come with 10,000 population, 50 of which 50% are working a workforce, a working age or capability. The rest would be considered dependents, families, non-workers, what have you. Uh, also, of that 50%, this non non work or non house is acceptable. Uh, a lot of your your peripheral builds will be employed. So, if we talk about uh, the civilian side of the things, you know, somebody that starts a restaurant, well, those employees came from someplace. Well, some of them come out of that other percent. But in this case. We split the remaining 5,000 50-50 initially. You start out with 2,500 workers and 2,500 tech ones. And then from here on out, we base planet popular worker pool growth on 12.5% of planetary population. So as the population grows, we would take this times uh, the, uh, the, the amount that grows, and that percentage gets added to our work pool. Our technicians, on the other hand, we can't grow. Those you have to train. So at some point, you have to build uh, your basic public education network or a BPIN to start in, or set up prefab education systems to generate additional technicians, or you depend on them immigrating from outside sources, which is part of what those event roles and ship traffic roles are for. And we will, uh, we will run across that at some point. This is why we have graduating, how many are employed, what, how many do we need? How many are unemployed? So ideally, we would like to have more people than we need. If we have less workforce than what we have, we run into a problem because there's a limit to how many builds we can support on our colony. Now, at the initial concept, we start out with 10,000. But if you set up that second colony, you decide to build another colony on an adjacent world, like we've discussed earlier, 
I have to bring all those workforce, everybody from somewhere to there. I don't get this prepackaged colonial ship project. It's, uh, it's not how that works. I have to build everything there from scratch, and I have to bring the people there to do the builds. I have to bring the people there to build the builds and to man the builds. So they have to come from somewhere. So some of this surplus here won't be here. It'll be shipped over somewhere else at some point. So when we look down here, each ministry has its own sixth amount of, of workers. In this case, uh, both workers and tech ones. And then each each build itself, the storage facility, which acts as both our exchange and our planetary warehouse, requires 30 workers and six techs. And so I've got already 36 of my 5,000 utilized housing concern, so on and so forth. So we look at the shipyard. The shipyard employs 500 workers and 100 tech ones. So that's 600 people. That's almost 10%. Uh, that's over 10%, 11% of our initial 5,000. So all this added up over time, and we'll keep adding in additional builds and things like this. And it doesn't matter if it's house-owned or platinum-owned or guild-owned. You have to support them. You're the house lord. You have to come up with the workforce to pay them. Otherwise, they don't function. If you don't have the workforce for the technicians to operate the build, then the build can't function. Simple as that. So we build a build that then becomes dormant and, and unusable until you can stab them. Okay. Another sidebar of the warehouse is what I call, uh, you call it your armory, planetary warehouse, whatever. Uh, the initial colonial effort came with a thousand ballistic or a hundred ballistic pistols, 50 ballistic rifles, a hundred units of light body armor, 50 units of personal body armor, 50 auto shots, auto shotgun, automatic shotguns, and 150 basic uh, melee weapons. All at Tech One. Now, remember I made a point in the previous one of the previous uh, tutorials that if we didn't want to uh, get a role where we might have to defend the ship because the ship's crew is unarmed. Well, there's a reason for that because as the house lord, we have to assign weapons and whatever to them. In this case, I could assign pistols at least or at least melee weapons to every member of oh, every. Uh, every crew, crew crew member of each ship I have, but that detracts from how much I have in my stockpile until I manufacture or purchase more. Our basic factory A complex can produce one ton of Tech 1 gear or weapons. And that means I would go to the equipment list and I would say, okay, I could produce 100 ballistic pistols every round or every cycle in that in that factory or factory in in cycle five i'll produce 100 pistols in cycle six i'll produce 50 rifles and in seven i'll produce 150 melee weapons that's how we're going to continue to build up our warehouse there's importance for these things in the number of applications our house needs defenses and we start out with the capability of having two platoons of protectors. This is the uh, uh, secret service for the house. The Royal Protector Service is what I like to call it. Uh, the watch, whatever you want. These are the personal bodyguards and uh, security people for the house lord or lady and or family and royal residences and stuff. Uh, and then you have uh, the Royal Guard when you reach the level of being able to support a significant portion of one. You have your militia. Now, the militia is your mainline army. This is the house's main frontline troops, and you have the ability to produce a platoon at the beginning. Based off of your population, you can continue to add more over time. To do that, we need the equipment to give them. Otherwise, you can have bodies, but if they don't have equipment, what good are they? They're going to go in and wrestle people. I guess that's a matter of choice. Uh, things like vehicles and tanks starfighters, atmospheric fires, all this stuff has to be manufactured or purchased and then applied to units. So you need, A, you need to be able to have those things or produce those things, and then you need the manpower to run them, which then allows you to create a, a unit based on them. Uh, you also have uh, some additional options for expanded security and or uh, forces based off of 
your various ministries. Uh, your culture and, and education ministry, for example, could have a ranger corps. These people could be your, you know, uh, people to utilize to go out and uh, keep an eye on the local wildlife, uh, just like we do with park rangers. Or they could be a, you know, a semi-secret or secret uh, uh, CIA operation. It's a matter of how you choose to spin it up. Uh, the Ministry of Intelligence obviously has two sets of of needed fatigue. You know, you have your 007s or your your uh, your, your uh, shadow knights, however you want to look at them, and then you have the uh, shadow operatives or your your special op teams. Both of these require manpower and equipment to operate. So, and we will establish some of those in in the future, in the near future, the next few uh, tutorials for that matter. So in order to know exactly what I have available, each one of my ministries, and there's six of them, I've got a tracking sheet that keeps track of things. I have my, my name of my squire, my squireess, uh, my beginning staff pool for the executive ministry, plus the additional growth based off of the po regional population, gives me 22 employees and my wages for these col my collective wages for these is comes in at 0 0.044 credits which is you know 44,000 Caesars uh, a cycle paid for to 22 people that would put them in the low to medium range for the majority of them for wages for standard of living I uh, keep separate my Salary for my house or lady. In this case, I've allotted five credits to cycle. This maintains a diamond status, a standard of living, which gives my uh, my my squire the ability to have some decent bonuses uh, for interacting in social and negotiations and things, which is important because if you're a ragtag uh, person uh, compared to somebody who's got obvious resources you're going to be at a disadvantage. Um, my personal assistant and or slice uh, ministry secretary is also maintains a fairly decent si uh, standard of living. This is both of these are personalities. Obviously I'm going to create a, a personality sheet for my house lady and then I want to do so for the her PA because the PA can act in uh, additional negotiation situations and other events if I choose to do so. Then I have categories like special services, which may include royal yachts, summer palaces, special retainers, irregular forces or supported directly by the royal family, personally and supported to the House Lord, uh, the Royal Colonial Center. Remember I made a point that on the up here uh, I had an asterisk. Well here's where it's located. It costs five credits per servant. And the Royal Palace also costs five credits. I've got space for my protector service and royal guard and miscellaneous. Uh, I will do in my next installment. I will I will show you how we set up these various military and neo military organizations. In this case, they're also going to get paid. They need to be supported, not just uh, their salaries, but what it costs for everyday living expenses. Uh, but my total so my total tax uh, need for my executive ministry is seventeen credits plus some change and I went through each one of my ministries Ministry of Commerce and Labor Ministry of Finance now in some of these like a Ministry of Finance my basic operational cost there's only 11 employees uh, the the minister and and his or her personal assistant the total wages or requirements is only two and a half credits compared to the 17 from the executive because these have no bills attached to them at, at this point, nor are they supporting other stuff. But just looking at this as a breakdown, for example, you know, this is capital based house owned bills relating to finance and banking, nothing. But <coughs> guild oversight agents and offices, the House of Central Banking computer located in the CC RAT, active house exchanges. Treasury agents or support services, planetary operations, sub ministries as developed. So if if I needed extra muscle, I could have my Ministry of Finance create their own version of uh, the protector service, and or I could create 
you know, revenueers, tax collectors, what have you. And we call them what you know, call them what you want to call them, but maybe they're being utilized in other ways. It's a matter of how you choose to pump them up or apply them. It's a matter of choice. So, Ministry of Affairs, Ministry of Intelligence. One thing I haven't allotted in my Ministry of Intelligence yet is a shadow, shadow budget. Uh, I recommend allowing a certain amount of credits every cycle to go to this and to accumulate it because from this you can utilize this as a secondary source of monetary resources for applying things like bribes or purchasing uh, illegal uh, blacklisted stuff or things that your intelligence ministry needs of, separate from the house. It's just a matter of how you want to apply it. Ministry of Health and Sciences, Ministry of Culture and Education, Ministry of Defense, and as a sub-ministry, a sub-ministry of Naval Operations. In theory, technically, you could argue these are two separate entities, but I don't choose to look at it that way. Currently, I don't have my defense force established yet, but things like the command and control, militia and aerospace spaces, home guard, house militia commands, special services, what have you, all these are going to accumulate over time. Uh, one of probably your most largest budget going to be, or your largest tax expense is going to be your defense force. Typical uh, real world stuff today too. The sub-ministry of Naval Operations, for example, is currently at 15 credits. And that's because I am uh, maintaining not only the Royal Shipyard and my small staff and the high admiral and her personal naval adjust, uh, adjutant uh, but I also am supporting the first fleet or the home fleet in this case cost me seven and a half credits those four those four ships in that shuttle so I and this base is pretty simple it's based on a hundred percent so if if I have my my scout ship weighed 132 and a half tons uh, divide that by 100 it ends up being 100.33 credits that's cost. That's the cost to pay the the ship captain and the crew, plus general upkeep of the ship itself. It does not include things like fuel, consumable fuel, food, uh, water. That's that's different. But my regular operating expense every cycle for those four and a half ships is seven and a half credits. So we keep track of that sort of stuff on purpose. And let me touch on the. Change from it. And we probably might end up doing a more, a more detailed tutorial on the exchanges. Period. <clears throat> when the time comes. All right. And the breakdown of our exchange would be there are close to two hundred. Uh, mineral resources and or manufactured materials, MR and MM, that's required by a given colony. So a lot of stuff here is based off the periodical chart, of course, uh, and some of it's not. So A, that's atmospherics, it's manufactured. AL is aluminum. Uh, AM is uh, administrative materials, so on and so forth. My production line, which shows what factories or mines produce what, my needs are what factories, what have you, required, what was mined each cycle, and this varies from cycle to cycle. Trade, what did we buy and sell during the cycle to the passing merchants, if any. What we've stockpiled in our warehouse is important because whatever we keep in the warehouse is separate from what's on the active exchange. If a ship, if I have 20 tons of administrative materials located here on the open exchange, this is so I can generate revenue. And a merchant ship comes along and I roll for cargoes purchased and it rolls this. They buy that 20 tons. I'm going to get paid for it, of course, but then my stockpiles dis dissipated and my surplus goes down. I won't get as much taxes out of what's left or none. And potentially uh, that I may not have additional material for it. If I needed that uh, material to, for, a, for a build project, I should have either kept it in the warehouse, or I should have allotted it specifically to a given build and taken it out of the exchange altogether. 
Then we have buy and sell. What did we buy? What did we sell? And for how much? It's from these we're going to determine our base, our base profit and loss. So we would go down this category and we would add up all the positives and put it here and add up all the negatives and put it here and subtract the difference. So if you buy more than you sell, you're going to lose money of that particular cycle, which may not necessarily be a bad thing as long as it's not a repetitive thing. Because if you, you can go really deep in the hole in this game and find yourself being unable to purchase a lot of stuff and wishing you had. But there's, there's ways to make credits. It's not really that tough. It's just a lot of, it just seems like a lot of stuff. And it can be a little daunting at times. But anyway, I'm going to go look up the factory bill. <clears throat> These are various bills. touch on this for a hair. The factory A complex. This is a tech one factory. Tax bonus to rent. If, if somebody else purchases it and runs it, you gain two credits. If the house or the, the house has to pay out two credits, if it's a platinum owned, the house gains two and a half. Uh, it has a damage reduction or a DR and it also has defense points. You know, these things can be attacked, destroyed either by your competitors or by NPCs or terrorists or what have you. So I have this, this is one of the reasons why knowing where it is on your planetary map makes determine somebody attacks one of your random builds. We need to know which build it, you know, where they attack, how do you defend against it, sever it, so on, so on. The base cost to build the factory is 50 credits times our modifier, our build modifier. <clears throat> In this case, it's 1.5. So this will cost 75 credits to build this thing, another one on our colony. Uh, it requires 50 workers and 10 tech one techs. The construction materials required to build our aluminum. We need 10 tons of aluminum times our 1.5. That would be 15 tons of aluminum, 15 tons of carbon, 30 tons of computers, 30 tons of construction materials, 15 tons of copper, seven and a half tons of hardware, 30 tons of machinery, and 30 tons of tools. <clears throat> and I will acknowledge that there was a lot more stuff goes into building something. But this is for simplistic purposes for the game. This is what you need. This is what you build to build it. And then it takes five cycles to build. Once you've got all this material times the 1.5, and you pay the credits times 1.5 to operate it. This is where we get to work this stuff here. Okay. Each cycle, my factory A is going to use three tons of aluminum. So my needs here is going to be three. My, my carbon's going to be one. My chemicals are going to be one. Construction material two. Copper is one. Hardware is one. Lithium is three. Nibarium is three. Don't ask me if I've got that acronym right or not. Promethium, Promarthium, I can't pronounce it, uh, is 05. Steel is one. Tools is half ton. And W is Now this is the material required. This is the material needs required to produce and manufacture the stuff that they're going to manufacture and turn out, plus the operating expenses for the factory itself. I'm going to go into detail on it because frankly this doesn't matter. But my production for this particular factory is eight tons of computers, so plus eight. And tons of consumer goods, and tons of construction material, and tons of electronics, and 
of the hardware. Check out the housing material. Like tons of textiles. And shop production, one ton. Now, on these exchanges, I've always leave these things for sections like other. So I would sit here and I would go back A. One ton. <coughs> and remember, I might say cycle, cycle four. 100. Ballistic pistol. So, as long as I've got this set like this, this means every cycle this factory is going to produce 100 tons of pistols. Next cycle, I could change this to another item, to another item. Anything in my, anything that's in the equipment guide that's tech one, we have the blueprints to manufacture. So, in theory, we could utilize this to build a tech one tank. If the tech one tank weighs 20, 20 tons, it would take 20 cycles for this factory to hand build you a tank. So in reality, you're better off building lots of personal equipment than you are to build a specific thing. But there are ways of getting, there's ways to build factories to produce those things that just cost more. But the factory A gives you at least some capacity for manufacturing those needed materials. So maybe this cycle, I'm gonna produce ballistic pistols. Next cycle, some light body armor. The cycle after that, I might choose to produce some, uh, some electronic scopes to go on my rifles to give them improved firepower to hit capability, uh, maybe some personal shield units in the next one, uh, maybe so on and so on and so on. So it's a matter of keeping track of them, what you're going to do, and then stockpiling it in your warehouse and then allotting it to those units or those personal agents or whatever that you're utilizing. So in this case, we also have to look at things like support builds required. Needs a housing concern and a power grid. Now, some of these builds require higher levels of infrastructure. It's not likely you're going to, if you don't have your infrastructure complete, then you can't support that factory. Even if you get all the materials that you could get, and you could convince or convince a guild or platinum to manufacture, build it for you. If the planet can't support it, you can't have it. It's simple as that. It's an incentive to get those things that you need to be built. Everything has its kind of tied in. So for this case, so an example, a manufacturing B complex, which is a larger back A, would require infrastructure one to be completed, housing, power grid, a light foundry, and a factory A. In order for this to operate, it needs to have another, a lower factory to support it, and so on and so forth. So looking at our exchange, we can come down here and say, okay, well, you know, I now have, uh, negative negative three here negative one here plus eight here I have a in a case construction materials as an example my factory produces 10 tons and utilizes two tons of it so I would end up with a surplus of eight from that eight I'm going to generate revenue but over time, I'm going to accumulate two. So in this aspect, the next time, if I don't utilize the construction material in some project or uh, somebody doesn't purchase it, uh, in my next cycle, I would have an additional eight. So this would then become 16, uh, 24, so on and so on, until we hit a limit. The maximum you can have on your exchange is 150, and the maximum you can have in your warehouse is 150. So you could actually reach a point where you're saturated. At that point, your factory just produces enough to meet your needs, and there's nothing left. So unless you have additional storage capability somehow to shift it into a different to shift storage around, or you've used it up, you're going to flatline it straight up. It is partly the way things work. Now, making credits off this is actually fairly easy. I have I have a, a set of of. Not a chart, but I have a list in here somewhere where I figured all that. So you just go look it up on the the index or what have you. Let's 
talks about section on economics. There we go. So if I have a surplus ton value of eight tons, my exchange is going to pay out 0 0.92 credits per ton. Seven point three six, so I'll round it up seven point four. So I would make I just screwed up on making these things left out two lines. Okay. So in this case, I have a positive of 7.4 and credits. If I look at my negative one in, in chemicals, negative one here, this negative chart is 1.01. .01. So I would have a negative 1.1. .1. And ideally, we go through and do this on every one of these. And once again, it seems like a lot of extra paper. But a lot of times, things don't change for a while. So I may not have a change in the negatives on my chemicals for some time. And that one number is going to remain constant until I've either purchased more chemicals, or I've got a factory that starts producing them, or I add another fill that uses more chemicals than I have, which then would change this and I would change that. But if I have a negative... 1.1 credits plus the 7.4 credits from the other one. I'm actually I'm actually going to generate 6.3 credits at the end of this. So we've added all the negatives and positives together. That gives us our total, whether it's negative or positive, in addition to things like uh, landing fees, taxes, so on and so forth. And this is how we're going to generate credits for our house. So there we go. This is how we set up that, how we work out that. And I have to go back and rework my exchange sheet because I left out two lines somehow. Not surprising. What happens when you lose all, you have everything on it and then it gets lost. You got to go back and do it from scratch. Uh, ideally, you could just get the, you just take these things off the, either off the web page, off the internet, we would establish that, or out of the, the co copy of the versions to the back of the book, and utilize it by paper. Maybe somebody will come up with a way of using Excel in ways I have no idea how to do. Don't know. Don't know. Okay. All good. But, at the end of the day, there you have it. Until our next one, thank you for being patient.